2018, it is just 11%. So it's a painfully slow uh, increase, very, very slow and not enough. And uh, because they continue to be dependent on energy fuels and because they continue to consume carbon intensive commodities, the emissions are just getting, you know, kind of outsourced, so to say, because they're consuming goods, even if they're not manufacturing it. So in that sense, they are somewhat responsible for emissions that are taking place elsewhere. And so the emissions of the US, it looks like, unfortunately, will be virtually unchanged in this period, unless they move into the, the uh, you know, moving away from fossil fuels, which doesn't look likely, or moving away from high consumption patterns. Regarding the sector wise, and the, the chart shows it there clearly. So you'll see these three ones are taking up the bulk, bulk. So like more than 75% of the whole um, um, use of, uh, I mean, sorry, the emissions are coming from these sectors. Transportation is increasing since 2013. Electricity generation has not increased because they moved to uh, natural gas. But finally, long term, it cannot carry on like that if they don't go in for renewables. Industry has decreased a bit, but uh, that's because it has been a lot of the manufacturing has been outsourced, so it doesn't show in the US. So the other two ones are there's uh, agriculture, and this one is residential, so that's about 10, and then here's something like uh, 12 or 30, that's residential and commercial complexes, so offices and residential, and your agriculture. So this is overall a kind of a situation where you see, um, okay, I think that's uh, about all that say regarding, I, said the main point. The difficulty is that unless they move away from fossils and unless they move away from high consumption patterns, we are not going to see um, any significant decrease in emissions from a major polluter. <clears throat> yeah, that's something. Hey, uh, thank you so much for that uh, look. Um, excellent presentation and really uh, thorough research done by your team. So thank you once again. Um, if group Thank number three can get ready, uh, this is uh, Aditi's group. You are presenting on differentiated responsibility, uh, explaining that concept. So if uh, the presenter has any issues unmuting, just uh, send me a message in the chat box. And if you need me to show the presentation, I can do that as well. Yeah, hi, Avantika. I could unmute now. I'll try and share the PPT from my side. I'm able to see it. And uh, uh, the presentation would be given by uh, Bridget and, and Malka. Okay, so that's it from my side. And now uh, the team members will take it up. Uh, Bridget, Bridget is uh, the first one to go for sure. the presentation. Uh, Bridget, I, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Bridget. And the comment about differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities is a principle within the United Nations framework on framework convention on climate change. And it is an international environmental law establishing that all countries are responsible to address climate change, but hold different responsibilities to take action. So on one hand, every country in the world needs to take responsibility and help cut our carbon footprint and pollution. But on the other hand, we also need to recognize developed countries like the United States produce a higher amount of greenhouse gases while developing countries cannot compare. So the concept of a common but differentiated responsibilities is that all states are responsible for addressing global environmental degradation, degradation yet not equally responsible. This concept, um, accounts for all the needs, for the need for all states to take collective responsibility for the environment while allowing countries of different levels of development to contribute according to their capacity. So a little bit of the his, a little bit of history during the Earth Summit, the Framework Convention agreed to the common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities to not hold one country or nation accountable for climate change, but for each country, because each country plays a different part in climate change. And you know, during the summit of the during the summit, the United States refused to accept principle seven of the Rio Declaration because it would hold them accountable for the pollution they have caused in developing country. And 
this mindset has continued with many other developed countries as well. So going into the application for the environmental, we see that the clearest manifestation of the common but different, different <laughs> differentiated responsibilities under the environmental pillar of sustainable development. For example, in the 1997 Kyoto um, Protocol, made a distinction between proposed goals for developed and developing countries by requiring developed countries to reduce their emissions while developing countries only need to report their emissions. And with poverty eradication in most existing literature, um, the CBDR applies to poverty eradication by encouraging other countries with the highest rate of poverty to focus um, to focus on poverty as their most pressing issue so they can improve their economies. And with finance, the first two responsibilities that fall on developed countries is the objective of duty-free and quota-free access to developed country markets for least developed country exports. Um, on paragraph 22 on the Monterey consensus also calls for appropriate institution and source and source countries to increase their support for private foreign investment in infrastructure development and other priority areas. Um, so for the next slide, I'll pass it on to Malka to, to go more in depth. Um, uh, hello, am I audible to everyone? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm having a few internet issues, so I'm just going to keep the video off uh, in interest of sound. So like uh, Bridget mentioned, at the Kyoto Protocol, the US refused to ratify the, uh, the CBDR principles, and there have been a few problems with the moving forward with it. Uh, so the way forward for CBDR can broadly be di distinguished as in external interventions and internal interventions. The external inter interventions include regional trade blocks and economic unions, where it is uh, proposed that developed countries, um, developed countries, um, treat developing nations more favorably so that they can take up some of their carbon burden and they can uh, leverage the existing trade unions to make sure that there is a uh, trade with developing nations or annex and non-annex one countries as they are also called and to leverage the value of the global power chains it is uh, it says that we should appeal to the consumers in developed nations to make greener choices purchase greener products and services which are generally supplied from your non-annex one nations it will sort of create a demand pull in the market and thus inducing green technology transfer to manufacturing hubs. And an internal intervention in this situation is that developing nations should leverage their cheap labor costs to invite FDI. FDI stands for Foreign Direct Investment and uh, uh, developing nations should attract FDI in, uh, in green manufacturing technology with increasing them domestic spending on green industrialization. Uh, this will sort of give them a bargaining chip in po global uh, forums by demonstrating their commitment towards reducing their emissions. So at the uh, Monterey Protocol, it was a few policy proposals were placed forward to ensure the effective implementation of the CBDR principles. The first one of them is to strengthen, uh, st strengthen the call for significant GHG emission reductions among developed countries and countries in transition. So in the spirit of the Kyoto Protocol, it is a uh, uh, and one of the biggest problems with implementation of CBDR was that the develop, developing nations only had to uh, mention they uh, only had to uh, report their emissions while the developing uh, developing nations only had to uh, report their emissions while the developed nations had to reduce them. And in the, uh, a policy proposal moving forward is that both both the annex and non annex one countries have to start reducing their emissions. It is the, it, there is an also a focus on uh, ending the current habits of uns unsustainable consumption and production, particularly within the developed countries. Another point is to apply multidimensional poverty indexes, particularly, particularly those that are created through the participation of people living in poverty, to identify different aspects of poverty within developed countries and to fine tune development programs in all countries based on their uh, population and poverty statistics. The next point is to encourage all countries to report data on the poorest quintiles share in national income or consumption and use that as a key measure of progress in poverty reduction in all countries. Then another point is to include the indicators to measure progress uh, on target 8.A of the Millennial Development Goals 
and to enforce the paragraph 15 of the millennial development goals which states that uh, we should have uh, we should move forward with a global partnership for development and to uh, implement the an enhanced program of debt relief for uh, heavily indebted countries without further delay and to agree to cancel all official bilateral debts of those countries in return for making their demonstrable com commitments towards poverty reduction. And the last proposal is to apply the UN's guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights and to include the SDGs in this session. So I think that's about it and I, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, great. Uh, thank you for that uh, presentation, uh, both Bridget and Malka, and uh, of course, uh, the rest of uh, group number three. Uh, we now have uh, group four. Uh, this is uh, Akuna's team, and uh, you're going to be presenting on uh, emissions of the rich versus emissions of the poor. Uh, so Channing is the uh, presenter. So Channing, uh, let me know if you're not able to unmute yourself. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, before you get started, uh, just a quick announcement for everybody. Um, after, uh, so just to break up the flow a little bit, uh, after this presentation, uh, we'll take a pause and uh, see if there are any questions for uh, groups one to four. And uh, we can have a, a brief discussion if there are any questions. And then we can resume with presentations five to eight after that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, Channing, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so our presentation was emissions of the rich versus the poor. And the way we interpreted mostly was richer countries versus poorer countries. Um, and so we start with this, uh, we start with this thesis first that basically says that wealthier, that first of all, our lifestyles are tied to emissions and that wealthier countries and individuals are disproportionately responsible for climate change and are more capable of mitigating the impacts of their of their own climate change, um, but as you've seen in the news and as you've seen in all of the different United Nations processes, poor countries are most affected by climate change and least uh, uh, able to actually um, afford the mitigation. And as such, the United States and other wealthier countries should actually take responsibility. So we've included this chart here, and this is the chart that everyone sees. And to some extent, this chart is misleading because it has China as number one and United States as number two and EU as number three. While those are objectively true, the chart on the next page you'll see actually shows a more, uh, more, a more accurate um, reading of the emissions. Um, in this chart here, you can see that the United States is actually the top polluter in the world per capita, meaning they make they have less people, but they use up more pollution per person, right? Um, and here on the side, we've uh, gotten these numbers from the World Bank, and we've compared the actual GDP, um, how do you call it, um, value of each country from the top three countries. United States, uh, China, and the UK versus the bottom three countries, Brazil, India, and Niger. And as you can see, the top, the wealthiest countries create the most pollution, right? Um, and, you know, it's our, um, it's our conclusion that the United States primarily and the EU must really take responsibility um, and in looking at the responsibility and looking at the history of them, we realize that the United States has not cooperated in almost any climate change United Nations, um, you know, process. Uh, the president of uh, the United States during the Kyoto Protocols actually walked out of the meeting. Um, everyone in the United States calls Obama actually progressive, but in fact, when we were in Paris in 2015, 
John Kerry, who was the United States representative, threatened every country there um, and fought tooth and nail to make sure that, um, uh, what's the term? Oh, loss and damages did not get into the Paris Climate Accords, right? Um, and that, you know, he also fought to make sure that the actual recommendations that each country submitted were voluntarily and not, uh, you know, um, required, right? Um, and, you know, this year is the only, the latest atrocity of their actual involvement or in an uninvolvement in the process where Tr President Trump in 2017 uh, promised that the United States would drop out of the Paris Accords. And uh, November 4th, I think, is the actual official date that the United States officially withdrew from the Paris Accords. Um, some of the impacts that we saw that developing countries are actually experiencing are extreme weather, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, a water crisis, um, and geopolitical tensions, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and as you can see from here, this chart, the United States has uses the has used the most amount of emissions, and so uh, our contention is basically that the United States should play, pay climate reparations and pay uh, loss and damages for every country, especially the bottom three countries and especially those that are polluting the less to actually be able to mitigate uh, climate um, effects, and I think that's it. Uh, great, thank you so much for that. Uh, group number four and Channing, a uh, great presentation. So uh, we'll take a, a, a short pause here. Uh, before we get started uh, with the questions, I want to just acknowledge, uh, we have a third team member here. Um, so Shreyash, will you uh, switch on your video? Um, in uh, our first presentation, it was uh, my miss, I didn't introduce him. So Shreyash is uh, interning with uh, the CSE climate change team, and he is currently a master's student at IIT in Hyderabad. Um, so Shreyash, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you just want to say hi to everyone real quick? Yeah, hi to everyone. I'm very fortunate to be a part of this just uh, to this uh, to uh, to be part of this presentation and to be part of this uh, course uh, thank you uh, yeah and uh, shash has been instrumental in developing the workshop modules and helping out with a lot of the logistics uh, so thank you to shash for that um great so uh, we can now uh, go back to the four presentations that we have just seen and uh, if, if we can go presentation by presentation and see if there are any questions for the presenters. Um, I'm going to do my best uh, to try to see that the unmute uh, option works. Um, and uh, if there are any challenges, you can also type your questions in the chat box. And uh, the presenters of each of the presentations, if you wouldn't mind responding um, to the questions that come up. So we'll start with the first one, um, Abhijit and Pooja's presentation on India's emissions profile. So any questions for, uh, on that for Abhijit and Pooja? I, I had a question, I'm Luke. Uh, so Abhijit had mentioned about this uh, forest cover growing, and he said it's gone up to 21%, and India is looking at pushing it to 33%. Now, uh, one is that, let's say, what, what was the, um, the source from which this has come? Now, well, my question is because of uh, something else, and I don't know any particular source, it's just something I've heard and kept hearing. One is that the growth in forest uh, area has been, is, it exists more on paper rather than actual practice. It's what is intended and uh, things were planted there, but not necessary that they actually came up as forest. The second is that uh, most of our increase in forest area has taken place through monoculture. Yeah, so just plantations of just one thing 
which is unfortunately not really but it may help for carbon uh, capture perhaps but it doesn't help for actual uh, growth of the place in terms of so monoculture and the decrease unfortunately has been in the northeast which has been tropical regions of forest so now is this a fact what i was asking and uh, that that's just it is it really uh, the fact that it's gone up to 21% has it really mm. increased our forest uh, cover in a significant way considering this that the decrease is in tropical areas the increase in monoculture areas well, it's uh, just a, it's more comment maybe than a question but sure, sure. the question is from where have the figures come uh, actually uh, yeah so abhijit uh, or the uh, or puja tiwari was there no was uh, taken from a paper uh, published in november 2018 uh, uh, on the energy and resources institute came up with a paper uh, terry so the figures are from that particular uh, uh, paper and i can also share the uh, uh, what we say the pdf of the uh, paper it's a four page uh, paper uh, if you want i can share that particular pdf to you if you can yeah uh, sure um, abhijit you could uh, share it on share it on the discussion forum as well uh, that would be great sure. yes um, thank you i can um, hi everybody it's shazneen from csc um look that was a really good question and about the fact about uh, if if these uh, increase in forest cover so this increase in forest cover has been registered by various ministries specifically the ministry of environment forestry and climate change now we are not entirely sure what does that exactly mean because they've been a bit shady about the details it, there's also another report called the biannual uh, report to the united nations it's uh, from 2018 um i think terry probably got the number from there you can you can look it up if you just google it it'll pop up online um and what you're talking about uh, the problem being with monocultures you're absolutely correct uh, we have a great problem globally with the uh, biodiversity loss monocultures are good at carbon sequestration in other words they just take up carbon from the atmosphere and convert it to plants and wood and biomass but uh, they're not very good at um, adding variety of life and the genetic variety that is required to sustain life on earth and to get to things like medicine mm, and food and yes. all those other things so you are absolutely correct that uh, uh, you are absolutely correct in your assumption that there is biodiversity loss which has also been acknowledged in the paris accord which you will i think study a little bit later in the next few days and um, other um, other pre treaties and negotiations through the years so yeah so that is something we really have to work at okay. yeah okay thank you any more questions for yeah. uh, we can take one more question for the first presentation uh, just a reminder this is on india's emissions profile <clears throat> okay uh, so we move on to the second one uh, presented by luke which is on us's emissions profile um any questions uh, for luke or the team uh i apologize one more uh, sorry sorry luke i'll just put it on hold for a second uh govin soli has asked uh, how have forests been defined in india uh abhijit and team uh, do you have any uh, insights from your research on this Are they still uh, online? Okay, uh, so maybe we'll take this question uh, offline. Uh, and I am quite sure that uh, the the biennial report that Shazneen mentioned, as well as uh, FSI, will probably have definitions uh, for this. So we can definitely take this question further. Yeah, very uh, quickly, I can um, comment on that. on how far forests have been defined in india so it's a little bit uh, interesting because in different government documents sometimes it's a little bit different uh, in india so a uh, forest could be anything from a cluster of trees that are uh, you know under a uh, half a kilometer or even smaller to to larger so uh, yes this is a very intelligent question and it you know sometimes uh, this is what's interesting we talk about such complex and complicated themes and topics but the basics are still a bit fuzzy because uh, 
the basics are super essential, but uh, it's a little bit hard to define because uh, around the world definitions are different. You know? So the best source would probably be to look up, uh, I mean, for Indians, India's emission would be to look up the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change definition of a forest. Uh, globally, probably the United Nations, IPCC probably has a definition. We could look it up and get back to you on that. Uh, great. Pooja uh, is trying to say something, but she says, can you hear me? I have the answer and I'm speaking, but voice not going through. Uh, so Pooja, you are unmuted. Uh, so I'm not sure why. Yeah, voice... can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we, can, we can hear now. Oh, okay. So I think um, you have already uh, sort of answered, but I wanted to say while doing the emission profile, it was more like land use change and forestry. And just wanted to say that they together, you know, like included also other any woody biomass stocks, you know, all the grasslands, the forests. And, and um, so in fact, when they sort of see from the emission standpoint of view, then it is like, um, what is the grassland conversion? What is the abandonment of managed lands? Um, the CO2 emissions and removals from soils. And also, you know, the data here is not, not really uh, very accurate because the sector itself is a description of the effective increase in emissions from the reduction of one of the planet's natural carbon sinks. So basically it differs from other emission sectors which describe the effect of adding a carbon emitting source where, where there was earlier none. So I think that's, if you look at the whole thing together, that's um, how we can say. But I think the exact answer to the forests, um, our CSE colleague very well explained that. So thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so back to you, uh, Luke. Uh, so presentation number two on US emissions profile. Uh, any questions uh, for Luke? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. And I'm also, I don't see any in the chat box particularly. But Can I, uh, yeah, go may ahead. May I ask, Vandika? Yeah. So Mr. Luke, it was great presentation. The one question which is in everyone's mind is like um, the Trump's stand on uh, you know, the Paris Agreement was uh, was something which was uh, depressing for the whole world, but with the change in government, uh, anything that you have come across uh, that how the situation would change? Well, it's not part of the immediate research, but reading through these funny months of the whole election buildup and the election itself, definitely Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been pledging for greater carbon responsibility. That is true. The people from the US might be able to say more on this. Just today's paper says that John Kerry has been put in charge as the carbon ambassador. So Biden wants to approach it. Now, uh, Channing had just pointed out that Kerry was not all that responsible at the Paris meet, okay? <laughs> so, um, so maybe it's just like the, okay, this guy's bad, but Trump would have been worse. So maybe we're settling for the one who's bad. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm just giving ad hoc. Huh? I'm, I'm not giving a precise answer. It's just uh, from what a little bit we've been reading and hearing. We are hopeful that it'll be better than it was under Trump. You see, with the US, actually, while they were showing a decline in the last two years, 17, 18, it's showing a steeper change, which is actually the impacts of the Trump administration. We hope that perhaps that even that in the increases will at least level out, if not decrease. It, it will be better, but I don't think it's going to be as great as we are hoping. That's all I can say. Um. There was, I think, Luke, you had uh, mentioned that you're not entirely sure about the INDCs, what were the US's INDCs. So actually, the US was on its way and had pledged uh, at, uh, uh, you know, a lot, uh, with the other countries that had ratified the Paris Ag Accord. Um, okay. This is something that'll come later. So I can totally understand how you haven't come across it yet in the course. But uh, just FYI, uh, so the US had uh, set up nationally determined contribution to 28% with an uh, attempt to uh, get towards, to, uh, sorry, 26% with an attempt to get towards 28%. 28. Yeah, okay. in the reduction uh, reduction of GAG emissions from 2005 level. And they had also pledged $3 trillion uh, as, as, as support and aid uh, for various, uh, you know, all the usually the developed nations pledge towards uh, helping out developing nations with capacity building, technology transfer, etc. So um, the US had set and we were actually, yeah, it's absolutely true what uh, I think Channing had said that uh, John Kerry was a bit of a bully and um, 
you know made them uh, made the targets voluntary uh, initially but it was good to have the us on board definitely better than not having the us on board trump had uh, pulled out of uh, the paris accord uh, uh, and it took him till the day after the election so i think your elections were i don't know was it the 7th november, november 3rd november 3rd and november 4th you are absolutely right i wrote a paper on it and i forgot the date november 4th was the day that uh, the us uh, pull like finally uh, the were out of the paris Acc accord but uh, biden uh, and uh, until then the us had contributed 1 trillion dollar out of the 3 but not got down to uh, re actual reduction gag but anyways trump it negated the whole thing now going forward uh, towards what will be again we will study this uh, further cop 26 which will take place in Glasgow, these climate negotiations that happen annually that we all hear about when they happen. Um, very, very important talks that happen around the world. Biden is absolutely, he said that on day one, once he's sworn in as president, he's going to rejoin the Paris Accord. Uh, that does not mean that the NDCs that were set by the US will be any more ambitious that they had been uh, five years ago, but it's better to have them on board than not have them on board. Um, but it's worth pointing out that in the meanwhile, since the five years that the US pulled out, uh, the planet has moved forward, all the countries of the world have moved forward. And now we're not only talking about reduce, reducing emissions by like 28%, uh, as was uh, requested by through the Paris Accord, but now it is about becoming net zero. You know, this is again something you will study further in the course because the urgency of climate change, the climate crisis is so dire that we can't do just like a little bit of a reduction. We have to like completely have zero emissions. Okay, going forward, uh, presentation three. Uh, great, I want to address uh, first a question in the chat box. Um, this is from uh, Ashima. My question is to either team three or four. For the countries that generate greater emissions but don't want to actively change lifestyles or consumption patterns, are there any global policies that help to push them along into accepting responsibility. So uh, either Bridget or Malka or Channing, uh, any of you uh, would you like to offer some comments on this based on your research? Um, yeah, I think I can take the first section of it. So there are global policies, which is the last section of the, my presentation as well, that there are global policies in place to accelerate the implementation of CBDR. And uh, if you see in the current Paris Agreement, there is a differentiation of responsibilities. Uh, there's a subtle differentiation of countries' responsibilities under the Paris Agreement. So there are uh, ways in which the pol like the Paris Agreement does state that in which ways countries are supposed to behave. In terms of consumption patterns, again, it is a very industrial and personal, it ultimately boils down to personal choices. And uh, the pressure has to come internally from within the countries themselves to not be within the country's own environmental mechanisms, which has unfortunately not been the greatest pressure as of now, but I think that's where the changes will happen if they do happen. Can I just uh, add in uh, yeah. something? Yeah. So uh, particularly, you know, the North-South and the South-South cooperation uh, you know, bodies or associations which have been formed, they are driving this whole effort, uh, particularly the uh, non-annex fund countries being able to, uh, you know, freely uh, trade between uh, the, these all uh, countries so that, uh, you know, the, uh, the effort towards, uh, you know, development is is more effective amongst the non-annex fund countries. Moreover, the tax credits which are given Particularly, uh, if if that uh, particular industry uh, works upon the GHG emission, I think that is one clear effort in terms of uh, policies uh, with the developed countries. The effort that they are putting in, so that the industry in developed countries takes up more responsibility. And uh, you know the the tax credits are substantial, and that's one of the reason which is driving the development of low carbon technologies, and particularly, you know, the technologies uh, in in terms of carbon capture uh, and utilization. So that's it, uh, ad an addition from my side. Uh, thank yeah. you, Malka. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that, both uh, Malka and Aditi. 
uh, there's a question here from Gangotri uh, regarding rich versus poor emissions. Can I get any info about the per capita emission contrast in the countries from the global south? Uh, yes, there is uh, data available on this and uh, we can make a note of this uh, request. Um, just what immediately comes to mind is CSE has done uh, analysis, uh, particularly on rich versus poor mm -hmm. emissions. Um, and recently, uh, Oxfam has produced a very comprehensive report on emissions of the rich versus the poor. So uh, there is some information available on that. But if you're looking for something more specific, we can definitely uh, try to send you some sources. Uh, uh, may I go on? Yeah, uh, actually, sure. Actually, I, I need the specific data about the India, uh, the per, per capita contrast of emissions, uh, specifically India, I need the information. So we uh, have uh, we have a paper, uh, it's a commentary, uh, we can send it to you. It's a very interesting take on um, per capita emissions and the carbon budget that is linked with the per capita emissions yeah, yeah. of, uh, and it does a comparison between the US and India and also considers other countries. So we will send it to you. Uh, we, really helpful. we have a question from Luke, uh, either for uh, group three or four, and uh, I'm going to request Channing perhaps to address this. Um, yeah, this is regarding uh, per capita, you know, emissions. See, on one, sometimes we'll talk of per country and that's not always a fair way to put it. Then we look at per capita, that is, it seems to be still, it's anthropocentric an approach, yeah, which is okay, fine. But uh, if we're looking at uh, resources, shouldn't we be looking at size of the country and then the emission of it? Because finally we are looking at resources which come from a particular geographical area, natural resources. So uh, shouldn't we, look? I know unfortunately that that would work badly for India and may let the US off the hook of people like Canada or US or something, which are large countries and yes. But if you're looking purely from the point of view of uh, you know, resources, natural resources used, uh, it seems to me that it would be a better option to take, I mean, who am I to say it of course, but um, a better option to look at uh, per, uh, per area, you know, use per area of, the, of that country or whatever, it's a geographical area. Actually, we have to think geography across the whole uh, globe, but unfortunately we think spots of it, you know, uh, cutting off nation. Now, uh, the reason is because if we then say per capita is okay, then you'll get, you know, China, India, etc. the emissions going up higher rather than, uh, rather than the other ones coming down. Uh, so is there any thinking along these lines of looking at geography as the, you know, area as the basis for per capita, for, for emission uh, comparison, or we stick with per capita normally? Uh, normally we stick with, per, we do, we tend to do per capita, um, because it does actually seem more fair. So while China is number one, uh, in carbon emissions, they also have lots and lots and lots more people than the United States, whereas the United States has, you know, way less population, but is using way more pollution. The other thing that, the other reason why we don't use geography, which gets a little complicated, is the per capita reading only counts, as far as I'm understanding, for the emissions that the United States is creating within the actual borders of the United States. It doesn't count for any of the United States companies that are actually having, yeah. that actually have, uh, you know, their their mills or their companies in other countries, like, units, yeah. like in Southern Africa, there's, you know, companies that actually have factories there and they actually produce a lot of carbon emissions there, but that doesn't get calculated as part of the United States per capita, right? And so that's a whole nother expansion on if we really had to do the geography, then actually now I'm kind of making the argument for you. <laughs> Um, but if we had to do per geography, I would hope that we would expand that to say that the United States is actually responsible for this geography, even if it's not the United States. Okay. Um, I just want to make a clarification on um, presentation three on differentiated responsibility. It was an excellent presentation. I really appreciated the work that everybody has done. 
I'm I'm blown away by the effort that everybody's put in, and that's really phenomenal that you've gone um, beyond the study material given. Um, I just want to make uh, it clear that uh, you know it talked about the MDGs because I think it was talking in relation to maybe it was talking in relation to Kyoto. I'm not entirely sure. We are now in the SDGs. MDGs are the Millennium Development Goals. That has sort of uh, the UN has updated it to the Sustainable Development Goals, which there is also a poverty reduction goal, very important yeah. one. So just like, you know, it's an update. Okay, right. Any more questions for three and four, three or four? If not, we should, uh, maybe we yeah. could take a two minute break yeah. and then continue with the other presentations. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, 12.03, so uh, we can take a quick water break, um, and just to take a quick check on everybody's schedules, um, we are running a bit over, but we have four presentations left from the climate impact section, which is super interesting, um, and uh, we hope that everybody will stay around for that, and uh, we can continue our discussions as well. So uh, it's now actually 12.04. So let's reconvene at 12.06, maybe. Uh, two minute water break, and then uh, we start off with presentation five. Yeah, Avantika, can you already just list who will be group five and six so they can already get their you know presentation and all that ready, ready to sure. spring? So uh, group five is Gangotri's group on cyclones and hurricanes. And group six is Amalan's group on extreme heat and drought. So if those presenters could just identify themselves in the chat box to me, so I'll look out for you. Yeah, and the rest of you, we'll yeah. get back in two minutes. All right, two minute break, see you in a minute or two minutes. Uh, great. So if we could all um, tune back in. So we have uh, Neha and Maxin from Group 5 presenting on uh, how climate change uh, has impacts on cyclones and hurricanes and the subsequent impacts of those extreme weather events. So uh, Neha and Maxin, just let me know if you're unable to unmute yourself and if one of you could share your screen. Yeah. Good morning, this is Neha. I'll be sharing the screenshot. Uh, 
uh, I'd request everybody else, uh, if you have a slightly noisy background, if you could mute yourself while the presenter is speaking, please. And uh, Neha, you can get started. Uh, Neha, your voice isn't audible uh, if you're speaking right now. Uh, Neha, sorry, your, your voice isn't clear. So would it be possible for the uh, second presenter to Hello. maybe start speaking because uh, Neha, I think you may have some connection issues. Uh, may I go on with slide one? Uh, sure, any one of you could get started if uh, her connection uh, is an issue right now. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so, Maxon, can you hear me? Yes, I'm sharing the screen right now, Gongo3. Okay, okay. So hello everyone, uh, next. Uh, Maxon just write down arrow and up arrow for next and previous, yeah. So uh, this is a graph by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration that is uh, NOAA on the data of the cyclones or hurricanes uh, with the presenting their strength. And uh, next. This is a graph on the data of land and ocean temperature. And uh, previous, 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 previous. Yeah, uh, here we can see almost from 1955 to almost uh, 2010, the strength of cyclones or hurricanes has been increased. Uh, and uh, in the next, uh, next graph, here also we can see that almost from 1955 to almost 2010, the land and ocean temperature have been increased in the same manner. Next, uh, we know due to the heat and warming, evaporation from water bodies from forms the clouds, which causes rains. Uh, next. The more warming, uh, there will be the stronger cloud will be formed and the hotter air will form and go upward due to its uh, lightweight and consequently a low pressure will be formed there that is uh, nearby cooler air will rush into there. Next, uh, uh, low pressure lead to cyclonic winds due to the earth's rotation that is anti-clockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Once a cyclone is being established, the warmer ocean keeps feeding it and warmer temperature will give rise to stronger cyclone. Cyclones happen naturally, but their uh, sustenance depends on the energy in the ocean and by feeding onto it uh, additional energy, which is in turn the result of atmospheric warming, uh, the cyclone can sustain longer and cause severe damage. Next. Uh, uh, now, on a timeline basis, we can see there from 1979 to 2017, there is a global increase in the proportion of tropical cyclone of category 3, and the trend was most clear in the northern Atlantic land and the southern Indian Ocean. Next. The, uh, in the Indian region, uh, the six out of 11 tropical cyclones formed in the Arabian Sea reached greater severely, which can be seen uh, since uh, from 2000 to 2017. Next. 
Also, we can see from 1951 to 2018, there is a rise in the severe category tropical cyclones over the Indian region, of which 49% in the Bay of Bengal region and 52% in the Arabian Sea. Also, there is a 105% rise in the Northern Indian Ocean during the post monsoon, that is uh, October to December session. Next. During the same period, that is from 1951 to 2015, the surface sea temperature of the tropical Indian Ocean has formed by about 1 degree Celsius. Next, which is much higher than the global average rise of about uh, 0.7 degree Celsius. Next. And from uh, uh, 1901 to 2018, the surface air temperature over India has increased by 0.7 degrees Celsius. Now for second slide, I'll uh, hand it over to Maxim. So Maxon, um, thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, hi. Thank you, Gangotri. Thank you, Avantika. I'm having some issues with my internet, so I'm going to keep my video off. If that's sure. Okay. No problem. Thank you. So, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to talk about uh, the impact that these cyclones and hurricanes have uh, on uh, three important categories. Uh, but before that, I just want to uh, make a point that. Uh, 2012 study by researchers from MIT and Yale University uh, found out that even if the, there was no climate change and the rates of GHG emissions remain stable, uh, the annual economic losses or damages from hurricanes and cyclones could double in the next century uh, with the global population rising uh, and which will lead to more development, especially in hurricane prone coastlines uh, the annual, the projected worldwide annual damage from hurricanes currently uh, in 2012 being $26 billion could increase to $56 billion in the next century. Uh, and this, uh, dam these damages would not be across the world, but and they would be disproportionate in that it would cause the most hurricane related damages, especially in North America, followed by East Asia, Central America and the Caribbean. Uh, and also, uh, these uh, disasters disproportionately affect people especially the poor and the most vulnerable. The three categories that we are going to, that I'm going to talk about are under the headings of people, planet, and profit, and how uh, uh, these uh, disasters affect uh, these three categories. Uh, the first one that I would like to talk about is uh, Cyclone Fani. It is one of the strongest storms to hit the Indian subcontinent in decades, uh, and it made landfall near Puri in India on the 8th of May last year with winds at more than 190 kilometers per hour. As we see here, more than 10 million people were affected, or 1.2 million people were evacuated to emergency shelters, and uh, more than 40 people were confirmed dead. It caused damage in both rural and urban areas of Odisha, except for a few districts, uh, especially in certain districts more than in others. And people lost their homes, as most of the rural communities live in mud houses with thatch roofs and asbestos uh, roofs. So there, that, so there is a, uh, an issue where uh, the, there was a disproportionate impact of this uh, storm on people. All the standing and stored crops were lost, having a devastating effect on people's livelihoods. While the direct loss of life was relatively low, if you look at it in terms of numbers, however, the impact in terms of loss of homes and livelihoods was enormous. Another typhoon, uh, a more recent one that happened was uh, in a neighboring region in Philippines where uh, five typhoons hit the country in a span of one month. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, this uh, a slightly older typhoon in 2013, Typhoon Haiyan, killed at least 6,300 people, one of the deadliest typhoons, leaving more than 11 million people homeless. A more recent one, uh, Typhoon Wamco, out of the five that hit the most uh, severe, with around 320,000 people left leaving their homes, 80 people dead or missing. And it had a similar uh, devastating impact on Vietnam, the neighboring country, with at least 239 people dead or missing. Now, what is the impact that these storms have on uh, the planet? Uh, a cyclone that hit India this year was Cyclone Afan, which we all know about. It destroyed more than 12,000 trees in the Sundarbans. 
the sundarbans is the largest mangrove forest in the world and sits on the border of bangladesh and india and this massive storm surge and sustained winds of 170 kilometers per hour uh it passed directly through the sundarbans and it irreparably damaged the unique flora and fauna in the region uh this is particularly devastating because uh as we all know mangrove forests play a key role in preventing flooding and other damage especially from tropical storms uh another study from the zoological survey of india reported that seabirds were blown so far on shore that they died of exhaustion and hunger as they attempted to get back to uh, food sources and uh in bangladesh uh, more than around 575 square miles of agricultural lands were destroyed so you have you see the impact that it has on uh, the environment and biodiversity and finally how we look at the impact on profit for this we go to slightly a uh, region that is slightly further away we look at central america and just uh, this month the two hurricanes hit this country of honduras uh, one is iota and the other one is eta uh, it is the latest known atlantic hurricane to attain the category 5 intensity and only the second category 5 atlantic hurricane to exist in the month of november on record the second one that happened the other one ha that happened in cuba in 1932 now iota caused severe damage to areas of central america particularly honduras and nicaragua already devastated by hurricane eta just two weeks ago one third of the population of honduras reels from this immediate and devastating impact and the long term effect on the country's economy crop production and small scale producers could be even more devastating according to the honduran institute for coffee eta alone lo left losses on the coffee crops of approximately 100000 quintals getting ahead in the country would be more difficult as the covid-19 pandemic has already plunged the country's economy into a deep recession together both these hurricanes have killed around 100 hondurans and local reports say that the damage will cost the country more than 10 billion dollars in the last two decades talking about a more general impact tropical cyclones have been the costliest natural catastrophe in the world with in the last 5 in the most 5 years accounting for nearly 909 billion dollars of the total 1.5 trillion lost due to disasters uh, while we have given numbers here uh, and we have quantified these uh, uh, these effects certain cost in terms of uh, the cost the effects that people undergo the effect that these has on people in terms of emotionally physically and psychologically those are some costs that cannot be quantified and uh, with climate change exacerbating these storms we are really looking at a disaster in the making and with that uh, we end our presentation here for today thank you everyone uh great uh thank you uh gangotri maxson and team um some great examples uh, in your presentation and uh, some really cool graphics as well it's always nice to see uh, data uh, represented in interesting visual ways uh can we now move on to amalan's group group number 6 and i believe seher is the presenter they will be talking about extreme heat and drought in relation to uh climate change and its impacts yeah can you guys hear me yes Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just share my screen and begin. Yeah, can you see the presentation? Uh yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh so yeah, so our topic is extreme heat and drought. Um Sorry, just a second. Um, yeah. Uh drought and heat waves are in ex Extensively linked and have devastating socio-economic and environmental uh, impacts. So uh, the reason they're linked is, I mean, naturally, because you know, the more there is heat in the environment, and the the more there is fluctuation in temperatures, the less um, you know water there is available for uh, actual circulation. Uh, so the thing is, there are a lot of there drought can be caused by a lot of ways like the like climate change can impact drought in many ways one is you know just generally the the you know less prevalence of rainfall uh, but other ways is also you know because warmer temperatures can enhance evaporation from the soil which makes uh, periods with very low precipitation and you know they, they become drier than they would be in cooler conditions so that leads to you know a positive feedback of sorts where very dry dry soils and diminishing plant cover 
can further suppress rainfall in an already dry area. So that feeds into the larger cycle and that's how drought kind of sustains instead of just being a one-time uh, one event. And these extreme events may increase in magnitude and frequency with anthropogenic warming, which emphasizes the need, increased need to mitigate, adapt, and adapt to future conditions. So naturally, you know, there's, um, while the larger, the larger, like drought does happen in a larger conversation of increased, or uh, increased and rising temperatures, but, you know, there's, there can be step-by-step -step ways, uh, which, you know, I will discuss later on in which, you know, we can first aim at mitigating drought and then further look at um, how, you know, the heating itself can be you know, taken care of. So Carbon Brief, it mapped, uh, like many extreme weather attribution studies published uh, till uh, August of this, um, this year. And heat waves accounted for 47% of these extreme events, uh, while droughts and heavy rainfall or floods made up for 15%. Uh, some of the heat wave events, as you can see listed here, are um, in Western Europe. Like it's not, uh, they, they aren't particular to just a few places. But the thing is drought mostly ends up affecting a lot of developing countries. Like a lot of East Africa has been very susceptible to drought. India itself has seen very bad cases of drought. And uh, Afghanistan is actually known to be one of the most driest places on earth, which um, it sees up, up to around 60 to 80% of loss of life in, uh, living, in living organisms, as in like livestock and such during these uh, drought um, events. So this, this is one of the pictures from the Nature Journal about attribution studies that were studied. So as you can see, like heat and drought are one of the two most, um, and, you know, ironically enough, you know, are raining as well. So, but this naturally doesn't take place, take, place in the uh, areas where drought occurs. Because uh, even, even if there is rain that is falling in certain areas, because of the increased heat, it doesn't really get the chance to stay in the atmosphere or the land to actually percolate and help the ecosystem in a way. It just evaporates very quickly and uh, it's kind of uh, wasted away. So the impact, um, when, the world globe, uh, when the world warms by around three to four degrees, which is a possibility during the century, uh, about 40% of the world's land surface is predict predicted to experience drought. High temperatures and drought-like conditions cause fungus and other uh, pathogens to flourish in the soils, which in turn leads to affecting agricultural crops, um, which naturally will then affect, you know, how much grain is produced and will, you know, affect the food production in general. Uh, despite overall consensus on heat waves becoming more commonplace, there is difficulty in determining whether anthropogenically post heat waves will emerge against natural variability. Um, there's also uh, because and there's also the very real possibility of the transformation of the ecosystem from a carbon sink to be a source of carbon burden because the less land you have covered by uh, by plants and trees and oceans, the less carbon gets, you know, um, fixated in the soil, sorry, sequestered, that's the word I was looking for, sequestered in the soil and, uh, you know, into the landmass and the water. But since if you have barren, more and more barren land, more is released into the atmosphere, which causes, you know, which again feeds into the rising temperatures. Uh, warmer temperatures have increased evaporative demand alongside concurrent shifts in precipitation, exacerbating the intensity impact for droughts, as you can see in this chart over here. Uh, the summary of human influence in event attribution studies. Sorry, this picture is a bit small. Uh, more severe and likely to occur um, through human influence, as you can see, is the most at 69%. Uh, conversely, drought conditions can enhance or dampen heat wave temperatures. Um, under three degrees of warming with present day commitments to reduce global, uh, sorry, greenhouse gases, uh, soil moisture deficits observed under the 2003 European heat wave will be twice as frequent and very much the norm in the future. Warmer temperatures during heat waves, for example, enhance evaporation, as I uh, spoke earlier, and amplify drought conditions. So now a bit more specifically about India. So since um, India's agriculture is impacted largely by the El Nino uh, heat a way that occurs in terms of external factors. Internal factors stem primarily from the discrepancies in the monsoons uh, that occurred, primarily the Southwest monsoon. 
uh, around 43% of El Nino effects are events are followed by drought in India. Uh, and I mean, this is largely uh, how drought is defined in uh, other places as well, but this is how the National Commission on Agriculture in India classifies the three types of drought. It's meteorolo meteorologi meteorological, sorry, agricultural and hydrological. So the way these are different is uh, meteorological basically, uh, you know, pertains specifically just to the precipitation in an area. Agricultural is the impact on uh, where water supplies are not able to meet the crop demands uh, that are needed. And hydrological is when, you know, the, it, the how the decreased precipitation affects the stream flow, soil moisture, uh, reservoirs, um, you know, groundwater recharge levels and things like that. So there are different kinds of drought as well, which is, you know, where you, then you can focus, you know, different mitigation strategies for each of these. And then these are just a few more st uh, statistics about drought in India. A study found that concurrence of extreme drought and longer, more severe heat waves are increasing in Gujarat, Central India, and Peninsular India. An analysis of fires in between 2004 and 2011 released by the Forest Survey of India shows that the periods with maximum fires coincided with dry seasons in all areas. So again, you know, the very clear uh, correlation between fire and um, dry seasons and droughts. And one of the, I think the most severe heat waves India has had recently has been last year from mid-May to mid-June, uh, where around um, 184 people died in the state of Bihar with many more deaths were reported in other parts of the country as well. And quite a few people died in uh, Pakistan as well. So coming to uh, mitigation strategies uh, overall, this is a picture I found from uh, the United Nations uh, Convention on uh, Combating Desertification. So, I mean, there are the primarily what I understood at least in this whole thing is that there's not, while there is obviously decreased uh, precipitation around, you know, that's a general trend with um, heat waves, but there's also a large amount of a lack of, um, you know, water resource management, which, you know, should really should be occurring in these areas. You know, in terms of just, you know, simple things like just water harvesting, restoring pastures, you know, ensuring that land isn't just left barren, you know, uh, planting, um, like practicing more diverse agriculture and, you know, having more diverse plant covers, essentially could be, you know, very, not they're not technically small steps, but they're easier and smaller steps that could be taken in the larger fight against drought, which, you know, which then could help break the cycle of increasing heat and, you know, um, help the, help the uh, environment as a whole. So yeah, so this is action, like this is vulnerability and impact assessment, monitoring early warning systems, which are incredibly necessary and risk mitigation measures. I think in India, uh, drought is uh, covered under, uh, it, it also has this disaster management approach, which came about, I think in the, it's, it's been around for quite a while now, for the, I think the last 10 years at least, which is, a, you know, which is a great uh, first step, but you know, I think a lot more needs to be done um, in general. So that really is, a, it's a very quick and brief one because there was a lot more that we could go into. Um, but yeah, that's a quick and brief uh, summary. Uh, Amalin sir, if you want to take any, if you want to highlight any other points. I, uh, any questions we'll be addressing at the end. Uh, sure. Yes, we'll, thank you, thank you. We'll take questions uh, after the uh, four presentations are done. Uh, great, thank you so much, Seher, and for the rest of the team as well. Uh, we'll move on to Group 7, uh, Ashima's team uh, that is presenting on sea level rise, and I believe Pooja is the presenter. Uh, before that, if uh, the last team, uh, Barbara's team, if you could identify your presenter to me in the chat box, that would be great, please. And uh, Pooja, you can get started. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Pooja and I'm presenting on behalf of Group 7. So the title of our presentation is Impact of Sea Level Rise on Bangladesh. So beginning with what is sea level rise? Sea level rise is determined by the average long-term global rise of the ocean surface measured from the center of the Earth, more precisely called the ellipsoid. 
Now, oceans across the globe, they have absorbed more than 90% of the heat from greenhouse gases that have been released into the atmosphere by us. And this absorption of greenhouse gases by the oceans has taken its toll on the oceans. Looking at some of the figures, since 1880, average sea levels, they have risen by eight inches. And out of this eight inches, three inches of sea level rise has taken place only in the last 25 years. So while there are several phenomena that contribute to sea level rise, the three primary factors to sea level rise are uh, thermal expansion of ocean water, melting ice, and sinking land. So talking about thermal expansion of ocean water, when the water heats up, it expands. So over the last 25 years, 50% of the sea level rise is attributed to warmer oceans, as warmer oceans take up more space. So talking about the melting ice, melting ice is melt, it's talked about in terms of melting of glaciers and the ice sheets. So when I'm talking about glaciers, there's a natural balance between glacial runoff and winter snow created by the evaporation of seawater. But this natural balance, it has been skewed due to consistently higher temperatures, resulting in greater melting and diminished snowfall. So as to talking about the ice uh, melting of the ice sheets, so higher temperatures, they are causing ice sheets to melt faster. Uh, for example, Greenland in the in the north and Antarctic in the south. So, uh, and uh, if you talk about sinking land, there are two factors. Uh, this is caused by groundwater withdrawal, and it caused it is caused by shifting of tectonic plates. Now, when we're talking about groundwater withdrawal, so when the water is relentlessly pumped out of the ground, it forms gaps. Now, these gaps, because of these gaps, these gaps cause the land to sink and fill in the empty spaces, leading to sinking of land. Now, with over 40% of the global population, which is around 2.4 billion people residing in coastal areas or within the 100 kilometers from the coast, the rising sea level is already causing losses in terms of human life, in terms of damage to property and infrastructure, in terms of disruption of agriculture, livelihood and health of people. So from this map, you can see that Asia will be the hardest hit by sea level rise, which is why we have decided to look at the impacts of sea level rise on Bangladesh which is the third most at risk country due to the sea level rise. So it has been estimated that by 2050, one in every seven people in Bangladesh is going to be displaced by climate change. And up to 18 million people, they may have to move because of the sea level rise alone. I'm going to talk about the impacts of sea level rise. So sea level rise, it leads to increased inland penetration of storm surges. So a storm surge is a rise in the sea level that occurs during the tropical cyclones. The storms, these, these storms, they produce strong winds that push the water into shore, which can lead to flooding. Now, when flooding takes place, water, it can travel inland. And because of the flooding, there is salt water intrusion into the agricultural soils. So if you look at Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, almost 30% of the total cultivable land lies along the coast and salt ingress results in degrading the soil quality which will impact the soil, that it might, it might ruin the soil, uh, the crops as well, and it can threaten the food security of the nation. Uh, this also leads to the contamination of fresh drinking water, which in case of Bangladesh will leave 33 million people who rely on these resources vulnerable to health problems, such as acute respiratory infections, they, it may lead to skin diseases, and it might lead to problems like preeclampsia in case of pregnant women. Also, I mentioned earlier that it leads to destruction of property and infrastructure. So the southern coastal areas of Bangladesh, they are projected to lose 40% of the productive land due to sea level rise inundation over the next 120 years. So along with personal property, it threatens human health, it, it, it threatens the city infrastructure in terms of uh, roads, in terms of buildings, drainage, harbors, seaports, and thus impacting the overall um, uh, health of the economy for the nation. So sea level rise is also, also threatens the coastal livelihood. So, so it threatens people who are dependent on tourism, who are dependent on coastal agriculture, fisheries, silviculture. So indirectly pressuring migration through adverse impact on job security for people dependent on coastal, whose livelihood are dependent on these coastal resources. Also, it leads to coastal erosion. So a rise in the mean sea level usually causes the shoreline to recede inland and coastal sandbars to move away from the shore and out to the sea. So this, this makes the, this area all the more vulnerable to sea level rise. So also 
uh, it is very important to talk about uh, the impacts on on women because of the sea level rise because it was seen that in, that in the cyclone disaster of 1991 in bangladesh 90% of 140000 people who died in the country they were women so today also if we talk about the condition of bangladeshi women so bangladeshi women they have less access to land uh, resources they are paid unequal wages and they have less uh, participation in the decision making process which makes it harder for them to survive post displacement also if these women they, if they migrate uh, migrate to the other area they are at more risk of being trafficked so this is this is also um, reflected in the number of bangladeshi women which are trafficked to mumbai brothels that have been rising also uh, sea level rise as i mentioned earlier causes large scale displacement so in a, for, for bangladesh every day between 1000 to 2000 people move to dhaka the bangladeshi capital because of climate change impacts loss of land and livelihood so while the majority of this migration in bangladesh is likely to remain internal there is an increase in cross border migration and this was reflected in uh, one of the one of the numbers whereby in may 2017 bangladesh was the single largest origin of migrants arriving in europe so also if we talk about uh, in terms of india so some of the most vulnerable west uh, coastal districts in bangladesh they lie along india's border so in the event of a disaster such as a cyclone or a flood bangladesh is sealed on three sides by india and some may be left nowhere to go so these are these, these are all about the impacts of sea level rise in case of bangladesh to conclude i would like to point out that bangladesh had early on recognized the severity of their situation and had and have integrated climate change cells into each ministry which is very unique to them to help mainstream climate change as well as to build capacity across the ministries also in 2005 they were one of the first countries to create a national adaptation program of action and 2009 they released the bangladesh climate change strategy and action plan so these efforts that have been put by the put in by the government of bangladesh in terms of adaptation measures they underline the importance of tackling the issue of climate change at the national level So that will be all for the presentation from group seven. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Pooja. That was uh, very detailed. Uh, you also touched on the very important aspect of uh, climate-induced migration. So, climate refugees are uh, really uh, an issue that we weren't familiar with before, but we are going to be now. So, yes. thank you for really highlighting that. Um, yeah, very you. quickly, we will move to the last presentation. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, we have run uh, over the initial schedule that we had uh, set. Um, this entire session is being recorded, so uh, we will be posting the recording online for everyone to view. Uh, we're also creating a discussion forum on uh, Moodle on the page of the group exercise. So, uh, any questions? We will have a short Q and A after this. But um, if there are further detailed questions, we're going to take those on the discussion forum and continue the conversation there, so that uh, everyone can resume their schedules uh, and their day-to-day -day activities. Um, so, we'll get started with uh, Group Eight, uh, Kritishtu. You're presenting on climate change and glaciers. Yeah, sure. I'm just starting. Good afternoon. I'm Gritish No. and i'm presenting on behalf of group 8 so our today's topic is glaciers now the first question is why or not we are talking about glaciers on a climate change workshop we all know the problem the glaciers are melting so why we should be serious if the glaciers melt because it has severe environmental effect and socio economic impact too what causes the glaciers melt it's the global warming that we all know now we have a pretty good idea more or less that what the glaciers are still if we go for a formal definition a large accumulation of ice snow rock sediment and often liquid water that originates on land and moves down slope under the influence of its own weight and gravity can be termed as a glacier where do we found them 
this is a global distribution of glaciers now we can categorize the glaciers either by their size or by location and thermal regime 91% of all the global glaciers by volume are found in antarctica 8% are found in glaciers so if we go by this location or thermal regime 99% in total are polar glaciers only 1% are temperate glaciers let us look at the dangers of a glacier meltdown so as i said about the environmental effect so when the glaciers melt it distorts the ecosystem of not only the location where the glacier is located also to the furthest region where it indirectly affects over the ecosystem in both the places the local species they face a threat of extinction so in that way glacier meltdown will cause an immense loss to biodiversity glacier meltdown cause sea level rising and that can cause a massive coastal flooding one third of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of a coastline they will be the most heated sector of this vulnerability now one thing we must remember that when we are talking about those direct results of glacier meltdown there are indirect results too for example uh, that kind of glacier meltdown will distort the flowing of ocean streams that definitely will affect over the monsoon cycles and that means a hamper of crop production so basically a large portion of the global population is bound to face a severe famine because of this glaciers meltdown so we all know the problem and it's not new almost it's almost 80 years that we are talking about this so what we have done so far and what are we doing we are doing pretty bad in this graph you can see that we have so successfully managed to rise the global temperature that now across the globe everywhere the glaciers are melting and it's a shame that in spite of we signed so many climate treaties agreements and protocols since 2000 the glaciers are actually melting at a faster rate so at this risky scenario what do we need to do right now definitely first we must to need increase our awareness even in the oldest democracy in the world that is in usa there are many climate change deniers and the picture is not very bright in the rest of the world either we must recognize the fact that the climate is changing we need to act we need to act very fast and we need to act bold otherwise we all will be doomed we need to build political pressure over our politicians until unless they are facing the threat that if they don't comply to the climate agreements we are not going to support them there is no much incentive for them to obey the climate agreements and it is very important to build political pressure because we all know that all the pro fossil fuel burning lo lobbies that is oil sector or automobile they are very influential in politics all over the globe it's very easy to point our finger at others but we have to do a great lot here we must remember that almost everything we consume because of their production process directly or indirectly they to contribute to the greenhouse gas emission we need to get rid of our consumerism we need to get rid of our consumer fetishism thank on uh, behalf of team 8 Th that's all thank you uh great thank you so much kritishnu that was uh, very um, the arguments were really well laid out so uh, thank you for really introducing the topic very well to us um so with that so kritishnu you can stop sharing your screen now uh so we'll spend uh, maybe about 5 to 7 minutes um to see if there are any questions so uh we've just heard from uh, four presentations so group 5 was on cyclones and hurricanes group 6 uh, was on extreme heat and drought group 7 uh, on sea level rise and group 8 on glaciers um any questions um maybe we could start with uh, cyclones and hurricanes questions for uh, neha uh gangotri maxen and neha Ma'am, 
did you come across any information on uh, the intensity of cyclones and how climate change is impacting that so we have been seeing that cyclones have become more frequent from a certain time period as you presented some information on the arabian sea and the uh, the indian ocean there's also a, a phenomenon around rapid in intensification of cyclones um, is that something that you came across in your research and could you talk a bit about that if yes Uh, yes uh, one one article that i read uh, uh, talked about a research that said that uh, we spoke about what happens when a cyclone makes landfall and over the years uh, with cyclones what happened was it was the coastal cities that were affected the most and as it uh, as it uh, as the days went by or as time passed the effect of the cyclone was felt lesser in in the inland areas uh, but now what is happening is uh, uh, the intensity of cyclones is such because of warmer oceans is the there's more effect felt inland and the cyclone stays stronger for a much longer time than what they used to before right uh, yeah that was the phenomenon that i was referring to in terms of the damage caused by cyclones these days so due yeah. to warmer air uh, the cyclone tends to linger longer over a particular landmass yes. and that causes uh, exponentially higher levels of damage Uh, mm. So it's a small nuance, but uh, in terms of the actual uh, the the you know dollars in losses and damage, um, it's it's quite immense. Uh, so yeah, thank you for addressing that. Um, any questions on uh, extreme heat and drought for Seher? um any questions for uh, the remaining two presentations on sea level rise and on glaciers uh maybe i could ask a question uh, um i think you talked about it a little bit sahir on extreme heat and drought uh mitigation to break the cycle of extreme heat and drought yeah. could you just go over that part uh, again or if you'd like to elaborate a little bit on it uh seher is not there so amalan is uh, present uh, answering um uh, could you please repeat the question please um mitigation yeah mitigation to break through the cycle of extreme heat and drought so there was a very interesting point on that uh, in the presentation uh, oh. but you're most welcome to expand on that a little bit Uh, I have no clue on that. Sorry for that. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, and we can uh, seek some more information on that on the discussion forum. Yeah. Um, any questions for the last two presentations on uh, sea level rise and on glaciers, or if any of the other teammates who haven't spoken up to now would like to add a comment or ask a question, please feel free. Yeah. um on uh, presentation number 8 group 8 on glaciers by kritishnu um i was wondering so uh, you would have learned in the science module of uh, this workshop you would have uh, learned about tipping points uh, so is there any um in your research did you come across um could you talk about tipping points and glaciers in particular in relation to how uh, atmospheric warming is probably driving a number of glaciers towards a certain tipping point could you elaborate on that uh kritishna you need to unmute yourself yeah uh, so as it was in the module so basically what happened that the earth is warming and it is warming at a rate that is the highest in the measured uh, not only human history but the measured geological history so definitely we are uh, coming we are reaching towards a tipping point but that particular point 
uh, point uh, i haven't put in my presentation for two reasons first uh, we have to be within the time limit and the space limit and the second thing is that we know all the dangers but still we are not acting i should say very maturely so uh, what i want is that if we are uh, failing to see i mean we are failing to do the minimum so let's focus on the minimum first so the bigger picture the tipping point so let us keep aside for the time being just what we must have to do it now so i just wanted our presentation to be more focused on it okay uh, great thank you for that response um so if there are no more questions uh, right now um we'll just do a quick um wrap up over here uh, i'm going to be sharing um, a slide on the next steps and um if you could all just give me a quick minute So first of all, uh, thank you to all the groups uh, for putting in the effort that you have today. Um, the presentations were extremely detailed, um, and we, um, I think, we saw some very interesting graphical and visual representation uh, representations of both scientific data as well as impacts data. So, um, in terms of just absorbing all of that information, it was very helpful to see how all of you had visually represented um, all of your material. And thank you for all the great research as well. So, um, now that we've wrapped up the first uh, five modules. We've covered the science part of the workshop and we've covered the impact section of the workshop. We're now going to be moving in uh, to the bulk of the politics of climate change. Um, so if you all remember, our workshop is on science, politics and impacts. Um, so uh, the module six, which is an extensive module on the history of climate change negotiations and politics, it's been made available for you on Moodle. The readings are uploaded, the videos are uploaded. On Thursday, we have a guest lecture by Sanjay Vashisht, uh, who is the director of the Climate Action Network South Asia. And the presentations that he will be presenting on Thursday are also uploaded on Moodle in the guest lecture section. So um, if you want to download them beforehand, go through them, have them open with you uh, during the lecture, feel free to do that as well. And um, a quick reminder, the Zoom login for Thursday's uh, uh, guest lecture is available on the Moodle homepage. If anybody is not able to locate that, um, just send me an email and I'll, I'll point you towards it. Um, in terms of today's, uh, the requests for reports and data that have come in, we are creating a discussion forum in the group exercise section on Moodle, where we'll be posting some of the requests uh, for data and other reports that had come in. Um, if there are any further questions uh, based on today's presentations, please post them on the discussion forum. And finally, we are we have recorded today's entire set of presentations, so we'll be uploading that video in a day, day or two as well. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it from us. Thank you, everybody else, once again, uh, for all the effort you've put in. And we'll see you live on Thursday at 11 o'clock uh, Indian Standard Time. Excuse me, may, may I go on? For may I go on for uh, Hello? Sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, during the uh, yeah, regarding the question uh, for our team, uh, the uh, question you have asked the intensity about the intensity. Uh, what I have researched the uh, in the tropical area, there uh, the uh, formation of low pressure is very common. But the thing is that there is uh, about uh, six condition to form a cyclone. So uh, uh, due to the um, warming atmospheric or warming and climate change, the uh, six condition is forming now. It is so frequent so that the uh, regular uh, low pressure are being converted into the uh, cyclone and they are uh, staying uh, during the more longer time and they are coming up uh, towards the land. This is just to okay, just to yeah, to uh, great. No, that definitely adds to that uh, perspective. Uh, thank you for that and uh, thanks everybody. Uh, see you on Thursday uh, for our guest lecture. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone.